It was uh, later today, and you can compare yours against uh, what's online, and you just see what, how to get to it. Turns out that question is actually not that difficult. It's uh, just a little involved, but not that difficult. Most of you got decision trees right. Um, some of you stumbled on the question with uh, linear classifier, where you know exams are not the best time to actually test people's understanding. So. Um, Homework 4 will be available today. It will focus entirely on learning theory. We'll be, we are almost done grading homework 2. Uh, final touches, we'll get that out to you today. Um, and uh, the homework 4 will be, it's a regular homework. It's uh, entirely, there will be no experiment. Um, and it will be entirely theory. So, as always, I suggest please start early. Um, yeah. And, uh, Projects. Uh, please get started with your project. I'm still, uh, given that there was all this grading to do, I haven't gotten to the end of your uh, project proposals yet. Um, the, so those of you who are working on the competitive project, uh, you've already seen a link to the Android Kaggle competition. Some of you have already started making submissions. Uh, I think the current highest right now, as of this morning, is something like 82% F1, which is very cool because. Uh, those of you who are doing the competitive project, also I would recommend you read the paper that's on the Kaggle uh, site because you, just to get an idea of uh, where you stand against the state of the art. And uh, all the others, everyone please get started with your projects. Uh, I'll be slowly giving, back, giving you feedback on the project proposals and we can do some course corrections as we go along. But uh, please do start. Any questions? Yes. Is the final going to be comprehensive and cover what's going to be done? No. Or it's just from now? Yeah. From uh, basically the previous lecture to the end. To the end. Yes. You have time for the final. Just making sure what I need to remember. <laughs> no, no. So, I, if you ask me what you need to remember, I would say everything. Because uh, I don't see this as a class that is really preparing you for an exam. This class is more of preparing you for life. <laughs> uh, but uh, in some sense, don't think of the exams as the primary thing. I, I personally think the projects, in fact, even according to the weightage, the projects are weighted slightly more than the exams. That's because that's the only place where you'll get to actually apply everything. And uh, that's the place where you have to think about everything that we see in the class. Uh, in some sense, that is the comprehensive uh, component of the class. Other questions? All right, so uh, I'll probably stop the class at uh, an hour from now, so that that gives us 10 minutes to hand out the exams. And uh, what we're going to do now is to pick up roughly where we left off. Uh, I'm going to remind you what we <coughs> spoke about, what we saw at the end of the last uh, lecture, and then uh, continue on from there. Uh, this is one of the cool parts of, really <coughs> cool parts of uh, machine learning that you'll probably not see in other classes. Uh, in some sense, this is the science behind learning. Uh, not the engineering, but the science behind learning. This is where we will ask ourselves, what does it mean to learn? So, uh, we are talking about computational learning theory, and somewhere along the way in the last lecture, we saw that really, we can't ever hope that we learn a classifier that's perfect, uh, you know, perfectly in agreement with uh, the true classifier. Why? Because we only have a small set of examples compared to every possible example that can exist. And we are hoping that we can use these small set of examples to, in some, hands, in some sense, identify the one right function that is hidden from us. And one of the, the first thing that we do in uh, developing this theory is to give up that hope. We can't hope to, you know, perfectly match the Oracle classifier. Instead, what we'll do is we'll hope to approximately match the Oracle. In other words, we will agree that we'll try, we'll be happy if we learn a function that is almost correct on future examples. So that's the approximately correct part of PAC. But even then, we can't, sometimes, it's 
possible that we can't even get a close approximation of the true function. Because uh, sometimes, you know, you're just unlucky and the training set that, that you get is entirely unrepresentative of the true distribution of the examples. So, so e even this hope is not always possible. We hope to get a classifier that's approximately correct, but even that might not be, uh, that might not happen all the time. So the second hope is that this event, namely the event that we don't get a close approximation is infrequent. Does that make sense? So we want an approximately correct classifier and the approximation we hope is as close to one as possible. And we want to get this approximately correct classifier with high probability. So we want an approximately correct classifier and we want a, uh, a guarantee that with high probability we will get that classifier. This is the intuition behind probably, prob probably approximately correct learning, fact learning, probably approximately correct. And just to repeat that, the only expectation that we can hope to get is that a good learning algorithm uh, will find you a, a close approximation of the true concept with high probability. And this is uh, formally quant uh, defined using the idea of fact learning, where you have these two small parameters, two small numbers, epsilon and delta. Epsilon is the is what uh, is way of, is a way of asking how close is your approximation. If epsilon is very small, that means your error is small. Think of epsilon as the error of the of your learned classifier. Delta, or actually. 1 minus delta is the probability that you will get a close approximation. So, in an ideal world, you want epsilon to be 0, in other words, 0 error, and delta also to be 0. In other words, with certainty, you will get a perfect classifier. And these are the two things that we are giving up in fact learning. With high probability, in other words, with delta small, or 1 minus delta high, you will hope that we get a classifier that is almost correct, in other words, epsilon small. And uh, in order to make this kind of statement possible, we need to make an assumption. We need to make two assumptions actually, and I have already covered both of these, and I will repeat them again and again. One of them is that, uh, the, the consistent uh, distribution assumption. In other words, your training examples are drawn from the same fixed but possibly unknown distribution from which your, your classifier will be tested. In other words, the world doesn't change too much. The future will not be too different from the past. <coughs> this is a strong assumption. Uh, it can be easily broken, but you know, in order to make the theory work, we are going to make that assumption. The second assumption that we make is that each training example is sampled randomly from this fixed unknown distribution independently of each other. And that is mostly there to make the proofs work, but also the, uh, in, uh, the this is the IID distribution, uh, IID assumption, independent and identically distributed. Every example is drawn from the same distribution, and every example is sampled independently of each other. Questions about all these intuitions so far? And this was roughly the last thing that we saw in the previous lecture. Now. <coughs> With these, uh, in, now let's define fact learnability. Uh, it's just a way of formalizing this, um, uh, these uh, intuitions. And I want you to keep in mind that this is what I'm going to present next is just a definition. I'm not proving anything, I'm just defining. In some sense, what I'm saying is if a concept class has a certain property, then I'm going to call it fact learnable. And then we'll go around asking whether certain concept classes have certain the properties or not. We'll define fact <coughs> learnability in the following way. Suppose you have a concept class C. We'll call C is fact learnable using a learning algorithm L, using a hypothesis-based H, 
is. So uh, before we go ahead, I want you to remember that C is a concept class. It's the set of function. It's the set of functions from which the oracle might have chosen the true function. H, capital H, is the hypothesis class. It's a set of functions that the learning algorithm L searches. And if H and C have no intersection whatsoever, essentially it's like this uh, game where you, not this, this uh, old story where this person loses a ring under a tree and searches under the light because there's more light. And, you know, because it's more, it's easier to find the ring there. You know you're not going to find it, but you're hoping that you'll get something that looks like a ring. Uh, that's essentially what we do in most of... Uh, uh, the learning, the uh, most real life situation. You don't know the true concept class. You search over a hypothesis space that's easy to search. So this is a general enough definition. The concept class, entire concept class is called back learnable if for every function f inside c, for every distribution over the examples, for these fixed small epsilon and delta, if you have m examples that are sampled according to the fixed distribution, these, are, these, these m examples are a training set, then the learning algorithm will produce a function that approximates uh, a, a hypothesis that approximates the function with, by, uh, with error epsilon and it will do so with high probability, with a probability more than 1 minus delta. So let's go over this. Uh, this is a lot of pieces, but really the only part of this that's important is here. Everything else is just uh, setting up the stage. So we have a concept class, we have a learning algorithm, we have a hypothesis space. So this concept class is path learnable if for every function inside the concept class. So it could be possibly an adversary picking the function. For every distribution inside uh, the over the instant space, what happens is if for that distribution, if m examples are chosen iid, there's no adversary here. It's just iid. If m examples are chosen independently, then suppose the learning algorithm is able to produce a classifier that is epsilon delta correct. In other words, with high probability, with probability more than one minus delta, it produces a classifier whose uh, error is less than epsilon. Suppose the learning algorithm is able to produce such a classifier for every function, for every distribution over the examples, and this is the most important part, the last line there, and the number of examples needed to give this guarantee is only polynomial in the size of the hypothesis class and 1 over epsilon and 1 over delta. It's only polynomial effectively in the sense of the hypothesis class, then we call this class, this concept class, to be backward. To put it very, very vaguely and loosely, if for every function in the concept class, with only a small number of examples, there exists a learning algorithm that can give you a, a good enough classifier most of the time, then the, class, the concept class is called back learn. And how do you say small enough examples? Small enough examples are when it's polynomial in the size of the hypothesis class and uh, 1 over epsilon is 1 over delta. Notice that I'm not saying anything about the learning algorithm. All we require for the concept class to be back learnable is there exists an algorithm. And what is really cool in what's going to come up in the rest of the class is I'm going to show you a way of just writing this down without inventing learning algorithms. We can decide whether concept classes are fact learnable or not just by describing the size of the concept class, the hypothesis class. Okay? Without even constructing a learning algorithm, we can say whether the concept class is learnable or not. Questions before we move ahead? This is a somewhat subtle definition. I want you to kind of wash, let it wash over you. Yes? So I was just wondering uh, why you call it polynomial? Is it just a definition of it or? This polynomial is a theorist's friend. Polynomial means you can do it in a reasonable time. 
no, it's sorry, reasonable. It, this is actually polynomial means you need a reasonable number of examples uh, because it grows. It does not grow fast enough. We'll see an example of concept classes where that are not that do not that fail the polynomial group, <coughs> where you cannot do anything without an exponential number of examples. And just to give you an example of uh, what, you know, you should, being in computer science, exponential should immediately terrify you. So, what, this definition is not the same as time complexity. It does not say anything about the time. It's not, it is not the same as space complexity. It does not say anything about the space. This is a new kind of complexity. It's called sample complexity. How many examples do you need? This is the sample complexity of the concept class. What we want is polynomial sample complexity. But, uh, you know, we are in computer science, we can't just get away with saying statements like, oh, there exists a learning algorithm. If you cannot produce a learning algorithm, it's not clear whether the, it makes any sense. So there's another definition. The same concept class is efficiently fact learnable. I think my pen is dead. The same concept class is efficiently fact learnable if all these conditions hold and the learning algorithm only requires a polynomial time. And polynomial in what? Again the size of the hypothesis class the, and the complexity parameters. Yes? But this means we need polynomial time? In a polynomial number of steps. The number of steps needed for the algorithm to find the classifier is polynomial in these things. Does that make sense? Right. Okay. Is this only valid for uh, finite hypothesis stages? Excellent, excellent point. Um, the first version of this that we we'll see is only for finite hypothesis spaces. Where, <coughs> and you know, one hypothesis space that does not fit this definition is uh, the linear classifiers. You know, the set of hyperplanes is infinite. So this is meaningless and uh, in the second part of this uh, chapter when we talk about VC dimensions we will invent a new way of measuring the size of infinite hypothesis spaces called VC dimension. But yes, that's a very good observation. Other point, other question? Let's try to kind of uh, tease this definition apart. It turns out, yes. Sorry for jumping in, Nate, but uh, I'm, I'm not clear about how do you define the error versus the probability. But the I'm error. <coughs> the error is. Hmm. The error is defined as the what's written down there. It's just you have some distribution over the examples, right? Error is defined in the following way. Suppose I randomly sample an example from that distribution. And then I give it to the true classifier and observe the prediction. Uh, observe the true. I give it to the learned classifier, H, and observe the label. Now, if these two, if the predicted label is not the same as the true label, you made an error on that one example. <coughs> now, for that example, Either there's an error or there's not, right? Which means it's an event. It's a binary. It's a boolean. Now, the, you can always ask, what is the expected value of that error according to this distribution? What's the expected error? And that is defined as the error. But in the last week or last week sure. before, you had error of like point 0.1. Right. How does that... Oh, no. That, that, that's just, these are all theoretical constructs at this point. We expect the error to be less than 0.1. We, it's always an expected error. We're talking about expectations. And but in Boolean, what does it mean to be less than yeah, You can think of if, if examples are sampled randomly from the true distribution, about 10% of the time you'll make an error. And this is sampled according to the true distribution. So, uh, there are two, really, I call this slide back learnability, but there are two definitions here. 
there is a polynomial sample complexity, that's in the box, and there's polynomial the time complexity. So we impose two kinds of restrictions. The sample complexity is really an information theoretic uh, requirement. What it means, what it's asking is, is there enough information in the training set to be able to distinguish two hypotheses? Because you're searching over a hypothesis space, right? So is there enough information in, contained in the training set, uh, in the set of samples, um, to be able to make this distinction? And if the set of samples is very small, probably there isn't enough information to tell whether hypothesis 1 or hypothesis 2 is better. So that's the sample complexity. The time complexity is, to answer your question, <coughs> is, is there an efficient algorithm that can use this polynomial set of samples to produce a good enough hypothesis? These are often, they, not often, sometimes these two agree with each other, but sometimes there will be, we will actually see examples, I'm only going to list out examples without proofs, we'll see examples of hypothesis classes where the, poly, the sample complexity is polynomial, but there's a the there are theorems that prove that there cannot exist any algorithm that is efficient, meaning it will the, the best the fastest algorithm for that hypothesis space will need an exponential time, even though there is enough information in a polynomial uh, number of examples. What we need is both these conditions. We, for pack learnability, we just the, the initial definition is just sample complexity. But for efficient pack learnability, which is what we really care about, we need uh, also to produce or you know, prove the existence of a polynomial algorithm, usually by construction. The other uh, requirement is uh, we want this kind of a condition to be true for any function because we don't have control over which function is the target function. So we want the, the, the definition, if you notice, has a requirement that says for every function in the hypothesis, in the uh, concept space. Uh, there are a few words that you might see uh, occasionally. It's some, an algorithm is called properly packed learnable if the hypothesis space and the concept space are the same. Uh, usually, we hope that the hypothesis space contains the true function which means the hypothesis space contains the entire concept space because we don't know which is the true function. The other, another uh, thing to keep in mind is that this is some sort of a worst case definition. This condition of the, the, you know, the algorithm meeting this uh, accuracy and uh, the epsilon delta constraints must be met for every function in the, in the concept space and for every possible distribution over the examples. Because these two things we don't have control over. Questions? Yes. Right. In fact, uh, that's one way of interpreting this theory, we get to choose a hypothesis space. So if we, what we would like is to choose in some sense the smallest possible hypothesis space that we believe will uh, agree with any concept that might exist. And we'll, make the, we'll prove that statement more formally in uh, literally the next five minutes. Uh, or I'm always optimistic, but in the next 20 minutes, uh, when we talk about Occam's reason, where we have to choose hypothesis spaces that are small enough and yet <coughs> expressible. All right, so, oh, so it is the next five minutes. Um, what we've seen so far is way back, it seems like many, many years back, but it was just, what, three weeks back, we looked at uh, conjunctions and we analyzed simple conjunctions from uh, and proved what could be called a pack-like bomb. It was a pack bomb actually. And then we moved to this, what we just saw, a formal definition of pack learnability, 
And this is just, again, I want to make it very clear, this is just a definition. We have proved nothing so far. I have just said, if a class of functions, the concept class has a certain property, then we call this class back learner. Right? It's possible that there are no concept classes with that property. It could be like building castles in the air. Of course, I mean, that would be a kind of a pointless thing to do if you're in a class, but it's possible. I have, all I have done is just make a definition. Now, I'm going to prove that such things can not only exist, they also have interesting formal connections with the principle called Occam's Razor. How many people have heard of Occam's Razor before this class? About half of you raised your hand, so I'm going to assume that two-thirds of you have heard. Because you know, people are usually shy. So, just to remind you, uh, Occam's Razor is a principle that shows up, uh, it's named after this guy called William, but uh, it shows, it pretty much shows up in every school of philosophy that exists. Um, and very simply, it says, if you have a phenomenon that you want to explain, simpler explanations are to be preferred. Uh, it, complex explanations tend to fail in mysterious ways. So simpler explanations are better. It turns out you can make formal connections between Occam's razor and pack learnability. Uh, I'm just going to give you the statement of the... Uh, so to make this connection, let's just initially... Uh, I'm going to prove a query. Suppose we have this concept class and all the whole, you know, there's some concept class, there's a learning algorithm and all that. Uh, suppose we don't have access to the concept class. Suppose we don't care about the uh, existence of a learning algorithm. All I want is the probability that there exists a hypothesis space that's consistent. <coughs> if you're given a set of examples, M examples, now, we want two conditions. We want a, a, a cla new classifier, hypothesis H, to be consistent with all these training examples. And yet, in the future, this classifier will make a high error, an error more than epsilon. Does it make sense? So, on one hand, it's consistent with M examples, the entire training set. On the other hand, in the future, it makes a higher error, error make more than epsilon. And I claim that the probability that such, a, such an event will happen is less than, let's see if this works, uh, less than that quantity there. Less than <coughs> the size of h times 1 minus epsilon power m. So as you get more and more examples, 1 minus epsilon is a number between 0 and 1. As you get more and more examples, this will uh, diminish very quickly. I'm going to prove this statement. By the way, I, I, the assumption of consistency is extremely important. Uh, in other words, what we are saying is, what's the probability that we get a classifier that's consistent with your entire training set and yet is not a good one? That would be the worst kind of situation to happen, right? That, that's not a good thing. So, this is an interesting statement. It says, such a situation happening is not only rare, as you see more and more, as your training set gets larger and larger, such a situation happening will get increasingly rare. And yet, the probability that such a situation will happen will grow if the size of your hypothesis class is, is larger. So if you get larger hypothesis spaces, the probability that you'll get this one function that mysteriously fits all the training data and yet disagrees with future examples gets higher. Let's prove this. <coughs> Such a hypothesis, I'm going to call it a bad hypothesis. A bad hypothesis is one that has an yes. So you mean that for a uh, very consistent with all, all examples, but uh, <coughs> for future example, it doesn't uh, agree with. We have a like we have x one that. Doesn't exist for in future examples. Right, right, right. It it's like that, that x one thing. Yes, it's exactly it, the intuition is very similar. Here we are not making any assumption about the functions either, because in that case we assume conjunctions, right? Yeah, yeah, just as a thing. Right, right. This is 
in the future there is some... Uh, so let me give you an example. Let's say, you, uh, since all of you uh, seem to be comfortable with decision trees, let's take decision trees. Suppose you train a decision tree. And suppose this decision tree... Um, remember that uh, the badges game that we saw? Or, you know, let's take the weather data that we saw in the decision tree class. Uh, you have to, I have to decide whether I need to play uh, tennis today or not. Let's say, based on a bunch of examples, you've decided uh, that I should play tennis or not. Uh, whether I should play tennis or not is decided by uh, this massive, massive tree with a lot of you know, subtle edge cases. Maybe down the tree there's a condition that says, if today is uh, the... <coughs> let's say if the newspaper today uh, had the newspaper headline today had the letter W in it, then I should play tennis. Otherwise, I should not. One might argue that that's overfitting your training set. Right? But it might be entirely consistent with your training set. We do not, that's an example of a bad classifier. I don't know why it's bad, but most of you might agree that that might be a bad way to choose to play tennis. And such a hypothesis, we are going to call it a bad hypothesis. It has a high future error. And let's call that hypothesis bad if it has an error more than epsilon. And what this says is, if your search space is so large that it includes these kinds of ridiculous functions, then the probability that you will hit a bad classifier gets higher because there's the size of H there. But even if you have such a massive hypothesis class, if you have an extremely large number of examples, let's say infinite examples, then your probability will get smaller, the probability of making future errors. So there's this trade-off. If you see a lot of examples and you are consistent with it, it's okay. If you have a very small number of examples, then you better stick to smaller hypothesis cases. That's the, uh, the reasoning behind this claim. So let's uh, prove this. So we have this bad hypothesis and it has an error more than epsilon. Now, you don't know that the training set is sampled IID from the true distribution. It has an error more than epsilon, means it has a probability of being right less than 1 minus epsilon. Right? But we know that there was this one training example. You have many, many training examples, but there's one training example, at least for sure, uh, with which the classifier does not make an error. It does not make an error with the entire training set. The probability that it does not make an error with one training example is less than 1 minus epsilon because the probability it makes an error is more than epsilon. So, uh, this so far so good. But the training set consists of not one but m examples that are all independent of each other. So the probability that this classifier survived m training examples which are all independent of each other is less than 1 minus epsilon or m. Okay, because they are all independent. This is where the IID assumption shows up. All the training examples are independent of each other and the probability that this classifier survived each one of them is 1 minus epsilon power m. This is one classifier. But how many classifiers are there in the hypothesis space? Some of you are whispering the answer. Just shout it out. Size of H. So, there's the probability that one classifier, one such bad classifier survives elimination by M examples is 1 minus epsilon power M. The probability that some bad classifier survives is simply, it has to be less than the probability that the first one survives plus the probability that the second one survives plus blah blah blah. In other words, <coughs> the probability that each of them survives is less than some, at least one of them survives elimination is less than the size of H times 1 minus epsilon power M. And that's the clear. Does that make sense? This is an, a, a style of argument that's extremely common in uh, you know, this sort of uh, analysis. So, uh, you know, ask me questions. Yes. So I don't have a problem with this claim being true, but it seems trivially true because if like H is 
huge, then and the probability is less than one, then it's like, well, yeah, of course, the number oh, yeah. less than one is less than a thousand. Yes. Okay. No, I'm not making any. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not claiming that this is not a trivial statement. Okay. Sometimes it could be trivial. Sometimes it could not. In the case that you picked an example where it's trivial, but suppose there are it's a possibility that there is it's not. Right. So if you have if H is extremely large. Yes, you're right. But if H is not very large, and you have only 10 examples, <coughs> that's more often the case. Alright, so let's just uh, see what this means. Uh, again, the probability that there's one consistent classifier that survives elimination by M examples, and is yet a bad one, namely has high future error, is less than this quantity. Now this is a quantity we don't have control of. Instead, let's put a bound on top of it. Let's say, what? let's demand that this quantity is less than delta. In fact, we are asking, what can we, what can we hope if we demand that this quantity is less than delta? So let's just say that size of h times 1 minus epsilon power m is less than delta. And now if delta is a small number, that means the probability that this bad classifier survives is going to be small. Right? This is how the delta shows up. Delta in some sense becomes a, this, this idea of uh, confidence. Now, from now on, it's just algebra. I can take log all around, you get log size of h times m blah 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 less than log delta. And uh, we do the same thing that we saw earlier, e power minus x is less than uh, is greater than 1 minus x. I take log on both sides and that gives you log 1 minus epsilon is less than minus epsilon. And uh, I do a bit of rearrangement. So uh, before going ahead, I want you to convince yourself that this algebra is not lying to you. So, I plug all this in and do a little bit of rearrangement and if my pen was working, I would be able to derive this thing. Oh, this is magic. <laughs> the, I, I always believe there doesn't exist any magic in the world unless, you know, your hardware unexpectedly works. Uh, machine learning is not magic, but I'm telling you, networking. <laughs> so, from here, I know that this quantity is less than minus epsilon, which means log log delta is greater than h plus m log one minus epsilon. But m log epsilon something is ah right. So now, notice that if I now just apply this, it won't work. I can't, because I, on one hand I have this, on the other hand I have log 1 minus epsilon is less than minus epsilon. So here I have a greater than and here I have a less than. So you can't directly change these things. Then the next thing would be, notice that if this is, uh, if I say that I replace the uh, log 1 minus epsilon by minus epsilon, then you get a tight, you get a more strict requirement. Right? If, in other words, I say log delta greater than log second edge plus n times minus epsilon, if this is true, then this is true. Not the other way around. So we get a safer margin, in, not margin, but a safer delta by demanding this uh, inequality. And now I can just rearrange. So 
So I can take the m epsilon on the other side. So I get the log. <coughs> okay, so now it stopped working again. So at this point, I can rearrange the the expression inside the box, and you get a condition that says if m is greater than this quantity here, then the thing in the box is true. They are just real, they are just you know rearrangements of each other. But if the thing in the box is true, then you get the condition on top to be true because of the uh, nature of e power minus x. This is actually basically the identical to the argument that we saw with conjunctions, um, except it's in the general case. We do not. We are now carrying around log factor of h instead of uh, the dimensionalities. If the if we are if we impose the condition inside the box, then we get the then we can the in series of inequalities shows that the probability that there exists a hypothesis class with error blah 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 is less than delta. Okay? Now, in other words, what we have really, and uh, the reason I'm kind of, I, I wish I was able to write this whole thing down because um, I, I encourage you to kind of revisit this argument and uh, do it by yourself. But the way to prove it is assume that this, con if this, con oh, if that condition is true, then you should be able to prove that uh, the size of h times 1 minus epsilon power m is less than delta, which is what we want. If the condition is true, then the probability of a bad classifier surviving is going to be small, which is what we want. Now, questions before we move on? If you feel like you're not comfortable with this argument, this is a one-sided argument. If the condition is true, if this condition is true, then the statement at the top holds, namely this one, not the other way around. <coughs> so this is a, a, a more uh, stricter condition, but. This condition really gives us our uh, argument for Occam's razor. Suppose you have a hypothesis space H. Then, probability, the, suppose you, you have <coughs> the learning algorithm that produces a consistent hypothesis, uh, hypothesis a, a hypothesis that is consistent with M examples. Then, the probability that it will have an, uh, this will have an error less than delta is <coughs> okay, today my, I'm not going to use the pen. Um, let me start that thing again. Suppose you have a hypothesis class and you have a, a classifier H that, has, that is consistent with M examples. Then, if you see these many examples, if you have a, now the number of examples that you see is more than this quantity here, then with high probability, with probability greater than 1 minus delta, <coughs> Your, the classifier that you produced is going to have an error less than epsilon. Why? Because we just proved it. But let's try to analyze this statement. If I demand that the error has to be very low, if I demand that epsilon is really, really small, then the number of examples needed is greater than some quantity times 1 over epsilon. Which means if I demand that if I demand a very low error, a guarantee of a very low error, that means you need a lot of training examples. In other words, the sample complexity is inversely proportional to the number of examples. Here. If you have a massive hypothesis space, then learning becomes harder. Why? Because there's a log dependency there. The number of examples needed is greater than log the size of hypothesis space. So if you have a lot, a big hypothesis space, then you have to, you need more examples to make the same kind of guarantee. If you want a high confidence that your classifier has a low error, then also you have to pay more, you need more examples. This time it's just a log 1 over delta, but it's not, it's a <coughs> uh, somewhat uh, lower complexity, it's logarithmic in 1 over delta, but you still have to have more examples to make this guarantee. 
Now, the reason this is called Occam's razor is because of the second point here. If you have large hypothesis spaces, then you need more training examples. In other words, learning and generalization becomes easier if you have smaller hypothesis spaces. And this shows when a, uh, a classifier that is consistent with M examples is uh, going to have low errors. Now notice that this does not say that big hypothesis spaces are bad. All it says is if you have a small hypothesis space and you found a, a function inside a small hypothesis space that is consistent with your entire training set, then maybe there is uh, this is uh, no, this classifier has a lower probability of fooling you in the future. If you have a massive hypothesis space, then the probability that the classifier it's easier to find consistent hypotheses in large hypothesis spaces. Yes. What if we kind of reduce this and pick a small hypothesis space that has one really, really specific classifier? How do you know which one that is? So, because you have to choose the, the, the reason that doesn't work is you have to choose the hypothesis space before you start any kind of... Yes, your learning algorithm has to know the hypothesis space before learning starts. That's right. But this is under the assumption that there's overlap between our uh, concept class and the hypothesis space. Yep. So, like... Oh, I more than overlap. This is under the assumption that the concept class is contained inside the hypothesis space. Because we are assuming consistency. For every function inside the hypothesis space, you can find a classifier that's perfectly consistent. So yeah. I can see myself falling into the fallacy of you know going to my boss one day saying I have a ninety nine percent probability this is you know correct with the confidence of this, but my hypothesis space could be completely different than the actual concept. Class. Yes. So that's a good point. In fact, that's the next section here. Uh, after we analyze this, we we'll get to this. Uh, after we kind of tease this apart, we we'll get to a we we'll ask that exact question. Yeah, that's nice that you can find a consistent classifier, but how could you possibly know? So, the generalization of this idea is called agnostic learning. Your classifier is agnostic of the hypothesis cl uh, class, and still it turns out you can prove a similar sort of a bond. It won't be the same bond, you have to pay a little more, but a similar sort of a thing. Other questions? Yes? I remember some, yeah, some people said that it's not important that they exactly consist, uh, the hypothesis in class and concept class uh, or, uh, be the same or overlap. If sometimes we care about how close they are to each other. How cl uh, not the sets themselves, but we care about how close can a function, uh, how, how close you can find a representative to any function inside the concept class in terms of error. We don't care about the functions being equal on examples that are rare. We don't care about uh, functions being equal on examples that will never occur. Right? So that's the leeway that we have. This is, a, this is the version of closeness that we are playing. But for this section, we are assuming the simplest case. We are assuming two big, uh, we're making two big assumptions in terms of uh, simplifying assumptions. The first one uh, is something, uh, a point that someone raised, I can't remember now, is finite concept classes. I think you did. Uh, we are assuming that this concept class and the hypothesis class are finite. The second assumption is what you mentioned, which is we are assuming that for every function inside the concept class, there exists a hypothesis that is perfectly consistent. So these are two big assumptions. We will drop the second assumption first. Namely, we'll, then we will move to agnostic learning where we will say, yeah, so what if there is no such consistent classifier? We, then we can ask, how far can your future error be from the training error? Then we'll drop the first assumption, namely the finite concept class. And we'll prove two similar state not prove, but I'll state two similar statements uh, of co sample complexity. One where you assume there's consistency, and then the most general case, where you have possibly infinite hypothesis classes, and we do not demand consistency with the training set. That will be the last part of uh, this uh, section. We are defining complicated to be 
uh, yes, that's a subtle point actually. Uh, I'm defining complicated in terms of the size of the hypothesis class. If the hypothesis class is consists of very few functions, then I'm defining it to be uncomplicated because that lowers your search space, that reduces the search space. And uh, uh, the way to think about this is we never actually ever enumerate the hypothesis. We generate hypotheses. So we say that our hypothesis class consists of decision trees. You're not going to ever enumerate every possible decision tree. We define the set in a more, in a programmatic way. We define it as, say, for example, all decision trees of depth less than three. All decision trees of depth less than three is definitely a simpler in any definition hypothesis class than decision trees of depth 80. It turns out in this case one of them contains the other, but it does not have to be. The set of all conjunctions is certainly simpler than the set of all Boolean functions. <coughs> and that's what I mean by simplicity. And I said conjunctions and Boolean functions, and that's not a coincidence, because we'll be now applying this idea to conjunctions and Boolean functions. But uh, before uh, actually applying this theorem, let's just, let me uh, in some sense restate what the, the meaning of, the, of, this state, of this theorem. Suppose you have a training set and I'm using letter capital D there and that's really bad, uh, it should have been S so, because D is, we are using D for the distribution. Suppose you have a training set S consisting of M examples. The way you apply pack learning, the way you apply Occam's razor is the following. In this, consist, in this kind of toy world of consistent and uh, uh, finite hypothesis spaces, what you'll do is you'll find a hypothesis that is consistent with all these same examples. And then, if M is large enough, then you will say that you can make the statement with uh, your, you, you can state that your classifier is good enough. And by large enough, you need to, uh, you define large enough using the hypothesis space that you kind of just searched over. And uh, using that thing. The other thing that you also need to do is, the other way you can use this bound is you can check that M does not have to be really large. So, let's say you have 100 training examples, but for your hypothesis class, it turns out, with the, for the epsilon delta bounds that you care about, you cannot do anything, you cannot, the, the, by applying this M, the epsilon delta and H into that function, you get an M, the, the, the requirement of M is very large. It turns out that you have only 100 examples, but the right hand side here is a million. You need a million examples, you have only 100, you can just basically throw up your hands and say, yeah, can't love. I cannot produce a classifier. Even if I'm a classifier that's consistent with 100 examples, it's not going to be good enough, because for these set of epsilon delta guarantees, you need a million examples. Of course, it remains to show, uh, uh, that is just one part of the argument. The other part of the argument is you need to be able to compute this hypothesis efficiently. You need to be able to, the second bullet point here at the bottom is the learning point. You need to not only say that, ah, there exists a hypothesis and all will be good. No, you need to produce the hypothesis. So you need to produce a learning algorithm that can do, uh, that, that can efficiently produce the hypothesis. What we did, and I want you to go back and think about this, is we actually worked out all these details for the conjunctions, <coughs> for the set of conjunctions. I produced an algorithm, namely the elimination algorithm, and I showed that uh, the, these kind of epsilon delta guarantees for So the set of conjunctions is efficiently packed because there exists an algorithm, and you can show these packed guarantees. Uh, as an exercise, I also want you to think about decision trees. Suppose you have a cell, so n binary features, you should ask yourself what is the size of the hypothesis space and ask yourself whether decision trees are packed Are they efficiently packed And uh, I can tell you the answer to the second question. They are not efficiently packed because learning a decision tree, uh, the ID3 algorithm that we saw, oh, actually, I take that back. Sorry, the ID3 algorithm will produce a consistent uh, tree. So, consistency is easy, easy to achieve. What about pack learnability? What about the sample complexity? Think about that. What, we, what, what I'm going to do now is uh, use what we just saw, Occam's razor, 
to derive a bunch of positive and negative learnability results. I'll only derive a few and then just take the others. We saw the case of conjunctions, but uh, we, it turns out we need not have gone through all that pain to analyze conjunctions. We can just literally plug in what we know about conjunctions into this Occam's Razor theorem and we get the answer. Um, general conjunctions are packed learnable. Why? Because how many conjunctions are there? If you have n Boolean features, we have 3 power n conjunctions. And this must not be a surprise to you. I asked you this question in the homework and maybe also in the exam, I can't remember, but there are 3 power n conjunctions. What that means is the size of the hypothesis class is 3 power m, 3 power n, which means the, the log of that is order of n. So number of examples needed is 1 over epsilon times order of n plus log 1 over delta. This is clearly polynomial in n, 1 over epsilon and 1 over delta. So this is how you use the Cockroach Razor theorem. You take the hypothesis class, find its size, take the log of it, plug it into that statement and see if it is polynomial. And you can again ask how do you use this thing? If you want to guarantee a 95% chance that you will, your learned hypothesis has a 90% error, that means epsilon is 0.1, delta is 0.05 and you have 10 dimensions, you just plug them all in, what you need is 140 examples. If the dimensionality increases, we have there's a linear dependence on the dimensionality, so it goes up to uh, about 1100. On the other hand, if you want to increase the confidence from 95% to 99%, that means delta is 0 0.01, and you have to pay a lot more. Okay? This is just an intuition of how such a bound might be applied. In practice, I don't think you'll be using this directly. I don't think you'll go to your boss, as you said, and say that I have a classifier that, uh, that has these properties because in practice, it's a uh, luxury to expect that we can go and generate more training examples. Usually, you have a fixed set of training examples and you can ask whether this, these number of examples are enough or not. Questions about conjunction? So here's a recipe for applying Packler, the, the Occam's razor for deciding whether you have enough, uh, for deciding the sample complexity. You are given a function class, in this case conjunctions. First, find the number of functions in that class, the size of the hypothesis class. In this case it's 3 power n. And that gives you size of h. All you have to do is just plug in size of h into that expression on the top and you, are, you get yourself a, a, the, the sample complexity for this hypothesis class. And then you observe, is the sample complexity polynomial in 1 over epsilon, 1 over delta and n, n is the dimensionality. The, clearly it is polynomial in 1 over epsilon and 1 over delta because you know the size of the hypothesis class does not involve those two things. So really what we are asking is, is it polynomial in <coughs> In this case, it's linear in n, so it's polynomial in n. And then you can state that this uh, set of conjunctions is pack learnable. But that's not enough. In order for, for it to be efficiently pack learnable, you need to produce an algorithm that can actually produce a conjunction that's consistent. A consistent learner, and it has to be, uh, you know, it, it produces a cons consistent conjunction in polynomial time. Polynomial in what? In the same three quantities. 1 over epsilon, n, and 1 over delta. Let's analyze one more class of functions. Well, this, the interesting part, the really interesting part of this result is sam the sample complexity numbers, the, the sample complexity results, don't care about which learning algorithm you use. This is an information theoretic argument. It says, I don't care what learning algorithm you use. If your learning algorithm can produce a consistent classifier, then with, if you have these many examples, then you have the epsilon delta characters. Which is very cool. I mean, you're producing a, a, a This is a statement about machine learning without looking at the learning algorithm. Let's look at uh, another class, functions. Three CNFs. A three CNF, CNF is conjunctive normal form, a three CNF is a <coughs> conjunction of disjunctions 
<coughs> where each conjunct has exactly, or actually at most, three elements. So you can have L1 or L2 or L3, and not L1, or not L2, or L3, and, and so on. So a literal is, remember, a literal is either a variable x or its negation. So you can have something like x1, or not x2, or x3. But the number of elements inside the or, in each conjunct, can no, have no more than three elements. That's a 3CNF. How many people have seen 3CNF or KCNFs before? How many people may have seen it but don't remember? How many people have never seen this? Okay, all the non-CS people are raising their hands. <laughs> uh, so, a, a three conjunctive, a conjunctive normal form is a general way of describing any Boolean function. Every Boolean function can be written in a conjunctive normal form. A conjunctive normal form is just a fancy way of saying a conjunction of a bunch of disjunctions. So you have a x1 or x2 or not x3 or not x4 and x1 or not x2 and not x1 and, and so on. So the function is true if any of these or's, <coughs> or sorry, if every one of these things have to be true for the function to be true. A three conjunctive normal form is a subset of conjunctive normal forms. It's a function where every conjunct, which is really all the, the every element here, every clause, has only, has no more than three elements. Every, uh, in this case it's uh, L11 or L12 or L13 and L1, L21 or L22 and so on. And each L can either, can we allow negations also here. Okay? just a definition of function and it's uh, easy to analyze. So the first question is what's its sample complexity and the, the meaning of this question is suppose if you had a consistent learner for this class of functions, how many examples would we need? And the way, again, we apply the same recipe and what more. What we need is to find the number of 3 CNFs. How many 3 CNFs are there? How would you go about answering that question? This was N choose 3. Why? N choose 3. I mean, I, I, first I'm not telling you whether it's right or wrong, but why is it in quote? First of all, Notice that, you know, this is a fancy function, but let's hope the pen works again. This is, this looks kind of fancy, but notice that really it's just a conjunction. The things in, the, if you, if you ignore the things inside the parentheses, it's just a conjunction. How many, con and it's not just any conjunction, it's a monotone conjunction because you cannot have a negation outside the brackets. Right? So, first of all, let's ask, how many unique elements can exist inside the bracket? You have three slots. L11, L12, and L13. Sorry, L11, L12, L13. Yeah. You have three slots. Each of them can either be a variable or its negation. So there are two n options in each slot. Right? So you get two n choose three possible uh, conjuncts. Yes? Shouldn't it be three? Because something you have up there that each conjunction can have at most three literals, so it should be zero as well? Yeah, sure. There. You can have zero as well. Uh, but we tell you, a zero is just the statement true, so that's ignored. Right, it means zero, I meant just not there. Sorry? So instead of having three, couldn't we just have one in our conjunction? You could, yeah. So it's, uh, this is the order of that. Okay. Yeah, it's two and choose three. Mm -hmm. right? right? So either you can have the first one or the negation. The, in terms of the big O, this is correct. There are some sort of things, but really, <coughs> at this point, we are going to make such a coarse argument that the subtleties don't matter. Okay. Yes, you're right. So the number of uh, 
conjunction is 2 and cubed. And now we are going to construct a conjunction using these many elements. A monotone conjunction using these many elements. How many, how many uh, monotone conjunctions are there? If you have these many elements, each one of them can either appear or not. And the number of monotone conjunctions is 2 power that number. The number of monotone conjunctions in n variables is 2 power n. The number of monotone conjunctions in n cubed variables is 2 power n cubed. And now we have, been, we have described all the three, three CNFs. So the number of three CNFs is order of 2 power 2 n cubed. Question. At this point, the problem is basically solved. Log size of h is n cube, order of n cube, which means the sample complexity is polynomial because everything else is polynomial. So the number of examples needed is polynomial in the dimensionality. So this concept is Packler. It turns out for, if, for co completing the definition, you also need to come up with an algorithm. You need an algorithm that can efficient that can find a consistent hypothesis, a hypothesis that is consistent with the training data and is a 3 CNF. I encourage you to think about how to find one because that will force you to think about what a 3 CNF <coughs> is and kind of just again inventing that algorithm will uh, require you to find in some sense synthesize everything that we saw about conjunctions as well. Questions? How many people understand this? Yes. How would it happen that it wasn't polynomial in one of our examples? Oh, it's not going to happen in this page. Notice that that part of the definition did not know about Occam's razor. When we defined that, we did not talk about Occam's razor. We demanded that it should be polynomial in one over epsilon and one over Occam's razor just realizes that definition. It takes care of the epsilon and delta part, leaving all the heavy lifting to go to the type of the hypothesis space. But that's in the consistent case, but we can ask about packlerability in other cases as well, in say inconsistent and possibly, I mean, I, I have already given away the answer, but it's possible that it might not. Because, uh, and that's a subtle question because the definition of Packlonability does not really care about Occam's razor or anything. It's just saying if this class of functions has this property, then life is good. In the realization of this thing, we need to actually make more assumptions like consistency or so on. And with such assumptions, we can prove this point. Other questions? So, last thing I'll do today is general Boolean functions. How many Boolean functions exist if you have n variables? 2 to the power 2 power n. 2 power 2 power n. So, log size of the hypothesis space is still 2 power n. It's exponential. So, general Boolean functions are not factorial. Why? Because you need an exponential number of examples to even, even <coughs> to, to, you know, to get the epsilon delta guarantee. So we are not even going to ask the question of whether they are efficiently backloadable because they are not even backloadable. Alright, so I am going to stop right now and start handing out the exams. Uh, before you guys get up, I want to make this as simple as possible. There are hundreds and hundreds of you in the room. So let's make optimize this. Uh, are all my TAs here? So please come to the front and we are going to do it alphabetically. So A through E will be here uh, and then basically we will go this way. Just ask around. Uh, let's, let me divide this into five groups and then we can. There are all the, all the TAs are here.